Okay, well welcome everyone. Uh, is this the first time, raise your hand if this is the first time that you've been to this uh, conference. Wow, there's a lot of newbies, that's great. Um, I think this is probably like my fifth or sixth or something like that. And it's always such a pleasure to be on campus and attend some of these really great workshops. So thank you all for attending our workshop, which is called Financial Wellness, a Foundation for Your Future. Um, I'm Liz Sharp. I'm the Director of Community Economic Development at Capstone. And my new friend, Lori Wood, uh, founder and financial wellness coaching for Evolution Financial Coaching. Um, so we're going to start uh, by just going through um, the agenda. So Lori uh, and I will introduce ourselves, tell you a little bit more about ourselves and um, why we're here uh, today talking with you about personal finance. Um, Lori's going to uh, lead us through the financial barriers for women and some definitions around coaching and wellness. And then I'm going to take over and go through some step one and step two and step three, I guess, um, all about... <laughs> Uh, where uh, where we need to be in our financial lives throughout throughout our lives with our personal finance, and then Lori's going to take over again, and we're going to go through some financial goals workshop. Um, during this time, you can feel free to ask questions. So there there will be an opportunity at the end to ask questions. But if there's something that you need clarification or you just have a general question on, don't hesitate um, to just raise your hand. Um, and we can address it at the time that we're talking about it. And that will that will probably be somewhere in, in here that, that you're going to be asking uh, possibly some questions. So this is me. Um, I am the I'm an accredited financial counselor through the AFCPE, which stands for the Association of Financial Counseling and Planning Education. Um, and what I, my main job is Director of Community Economic Development at Capstone Community Action, which is one of the five community action agencies around Vermont. Um, I've spent a lot of my years working there doing one-on-one -on -one financial coaching and counseling um, for Vermonters. Um, currently, I oversee a number of programs that are related to economic development. So we have a micro-business development program where we do coaching. We have volunteer income tax assistance program. We have um, financial coaching. We have a new program. Um, in fact, my colleague uh, Lori Kosar is teaching a class right now called Green Savings Smart, which is a financial coaching program but with the lens of helping us as Vermonters transition away from fossil fuel technologies. So helping low and moderate income Vermonters navigate all those incentives and credits and programs and services that are out there to help us make the transition. Um, and we provide one-on-one um, -on -one coaching and workshops that are free and we really are here to help people save money, reduce debt, build credit and become more financially secure. And maybe if you listen to uh, the noon time show called Vermont Edition, I am usually on there about once or twice a year talking about personal finance. So that's something that I have fun doing. Um, so now I'm going to pass it over to my new friend and colleague, <laughs> Lori Wood. Great. Thank you, Liz. So thank you all for being here today. It's a great day uh, here in Vermont, a uh, nice fall day, and such a great lead into this day from Patrick Leahy and Janet Yellen and Marcel Leahy. Thank them so much for this conference that they've put on. Um, I'm pleased to be a presenter because I've been an attendee at this conference before. I lived in San Francisco and moved back to Vermont about 13 years ago and I wanted to see what was going on in the, in the world of women's economic development. So I decided to attend the conference and I was just so pleased. I, I came the year that Sonia Sotomayor was the keynote speaker, and it was just such an awesome opportunity to hear her speak and to see the way that Vermont, and especially Patrick Leahy, have worked to lift women up. So it's such a great legacy that he leaves behind as he retires this year, and I wish him well in his retirement. And it's so great to have Janet Yellen here, because I put a little something about her in my presentation, and I don't know, so we'll see what we got. So, you know, you can read the, the bullets here, you know, business management degree from Champlain College and a 30-year career. But the story behind the story, I think, is a little more interesting. So I got my business management degree at Champlain College when I was 29 years old. I was um, a daughter of a single mom. I was 35 children. And we grew up on public assistance. And it was really hard, right? It's really hard to do that. So. 
I moved out on my own into my own apartment three days after I graduated from high school from Spalding. There's some women here from Mary. Um, so I graduated from Spalding High School. I, I moved out on my own and I set out to create my own economic foundation. I put myself through college, so I moved to Burlington at some point in that time frame. And I put together my degree by taking classes at St. Michael's College, UVM, Community College of Vermont, and Champlain College. And I was fortunate enough that I worked for IDX, and I don't know if some of you may know the history of IDX in our state, a large employer, um, then bought by GE Healthcare. You know, I was fortunate enough to work in that organization and I became a manager in that business and was working on my business management degree. So I was learning while I was doing. So it's a really great way to get that education. So um, I have had the fortunate um, happenstance of my life to be able to create a solid economic foundation and I retired, semi-retired at 57 this year. So still, I'm well, 58 now, <laughs> it's been a year. Um, but throughout my career and throughout my history, I built and utilized tools. I would help my employees, so the people that were on my staff, make sure that they were taking advantage of corporate benefits like 401k and making sure they got the raises they were, they were, they were earning, right? They worked their careers to obtain. And I decided, um, you know, in the pandemic, I was tired of traveling to New York City. I was working with major hospital chains in New York City, like Memorial Sloan Kettering and other organizations. I was tired of getting on the plane every week and going to New York City. So when the pandemic came, I was like, hmm, this is an opportunity to just sit back. And I did something before it became popular. I quiet quit, right? So everyone been hearing <laughs> quiet quitting? I stepped out of my management role. I was looking for all scripts at the time. I, I'm gonna have to be careful what I say because we are on TV. <laughs> um, so I stepped, I took a little bit of a step back from my management job. I became an individual contributor for the next year and I worked with a very large, well, the largest healthcare organization in the Northeast called Northwell Health. And I was sitting back and I was thinking, you know what, I don't wanna do this for very much longer, so what am I gonna do? So I was talking with one of my friends who's a mentor and she's like, you have been financially coaching people your entire career, why don't you make a business out of it? So I did. I found the Financial Coach Academy headquartered in um, Arizona and I took some formal training about how to start a business because I'd been in business for 30 years but I had never started my own. I didn't really know all the steps I needed to take. So I walked down that path I launched my business and today I have 55 clients. I'm you know, doing well, I enjoy it, and I'm doing as much as I want. My, my goal for this period of my life is called periodic part-time, so I work when I want <laughs> and as much as I want. Um, my ideal client that I want to work with right now is women, women who want to become more confident and confident in managing their financial wellness who need to solidify that, that backbone and that foundation that they've had, whether they're 25 or 65. So helping women understand what you have and how you can grow that, and um, being able to look at a lot of different areas um, of your financial world. So that's one of the things that I'm really passionate about. I think of financial wellness as a form of self-care. We need money to live. That is a fact of life. We need to feed ourselves, we need to put a roof over our head, we need to have transportation to go to the doctor, to, to work. So it's important that we create that solid financial foundation so that we can do all of those things. And as Janet Yellen, she didn't know she was teeing up my presentation, <laughs> or my portion of this presentation, but we need to continue to reduce the financial barriers that women have seen and felt over the years. So let's talk about what a few of those are. So how many women, I know some of us were born before 1970, I'm one of them, how many remember that you couldn't get a credit card in your own name if you were a single woman, right? And thank you, RBG, right? So there was a lot of things she did for us, and that was one of them. <laughs> and, you know, married women could get credit cards, and Vernon, I might have to pick on you every now and then, just because mm. you are, sorry, the token man in the presentation. <laughs> but. You know, Vernon's wife could have gotten a credit card because he, he was a man and he had a wife, or has a wife, sorry. She, he's sitting in for her today, so he told me about this morning. But she could only get 50% of the credit limit that he could get. Fair? You decide. Women, it was 
was also really difficult to pursue a co-ed Ivy League education. And co-ed is really the term there, right? So, you know, Harvard had Radcliffe. There were women's colleges associated with a lot of the professional universities, or with a lot of the Ivy League universities. But women and men couldn't sit and learn together. That's not, that's not creating a, a place where people are going to work together and continue to function together, right? It's, it's putting different, it's putting people against each other. And when, you, when women did get into those Ivy League educations, again, let's go to RBG. She might come up a couple times in my presentation. <laughs> she was one of the seven women in Harvard Law School. And the dean of Harvard Law School at that time had a practice of inviting the women to dinner at his house with he and his wife and having them tell him why they thought they should have a place that a man should be sitting in. Really, that's what happened back then. You know, and sometimes those things still happen today. So we need to, those are some of the barriers that Pat Leahy talked about that we really need to, to, to break down. We still need to continue to break them down. Health insurance, that was something that Janet Yellen talked a lot about. Women pay more for health care insurance premiums than men because we access health care. We have children. We, um, we have parts that need regular review, right? So we, we go to the doctor probably more frequently than most men. And it wasn't until 2010 under Barack Obama that the gender disparity in health care premiums was addressed. 2010. Women could also not be guaranteed for getting, uh, couldn't be guaranteed that they wouldn't get fired or demoted for getting pregnant. Again, RBG. She graduated from college, she followed her husband, I think it was Kansas, and she worked for the Social Security Administration. She was demoted when she got pregnant for her first child. What did she do? She went to Harvard Law School and started fighting for women to address the issues that she'd been facing as a woman, right? So those are the things we can do. Women couldn't obtain birth control. Again, Janet Yellen talked about childcare, and you could get fired for getting pregnant, but you couldn't practice family planning, right? So married women could get birth control if, they, if their husband could prove that they were using it for family planning, but single women couldn't get it until the 70s. Crazy, right? And don't get me started on Roe v. Wade. <laughs> and financial equality in the workplace. Is, is a problem and was a problem and still is a problem. I'm just gonna share a story from when I was a manager at a company, I'm not gonna name the company or the people, but I was a manager at a company in the 80s and I had been promoted to supervisor the year before and I was getting promoted to a management position and I was promoting two women to supervisors behind me. And we were sitting in a budget meeting, it was my boss, the, the, the president of the division of the company and the um, accountant who was, you know, we were working on budgets. And the male man in the room, president of the company, said, you, we can promote these two people, but they're gonna get half of their raise this year and half of their raise next year. Would you think that's fair? No. So they had done that to me. So we always try to make it better for those that come behind us, right? So. I said to the manager, to the, to the president of the division, I said, I'm sorry, but I don't support this. And they get their, they get their full raise or, or I'm not part of this. And he's like, well, it's a lot of money. They might not know how to handle it. I was like, oh, really? And I, I said, well, let me tell you, this, this one woman, Lisa, did you know that she worked in Manhattan and she worked on Wall Street before she moved to Vermont because she wanted to change her life? I think she knows how to handle money. Pretty sure about it. Pretty good with that. He's like, well, you know, we, had, we went back and forth. And I finally said, I am not backing down on this. If you want to proceed with this, then you can tell them why they're getting half of their raise this year and half next. I'd be happy to join the conversation, but I'm not leading it. And he was like, oh. So, we, walked, we ended the meeting, we agreed to disagree, and the next day he walked into my office and he said, we'll do it your way. And I was like, we have to fight. You know, that was one example, and that was back in the 80s, but we have to fight for other women and we have to support other women. What did Madeleine Albright say? There's a special place in hell for those who don't, for women who don't support other women, right? <laughs> so it's important to think about the financial equality issues that we're 
still facing today and do what we can to support them. And I was glad that I was in a position to support that decision um, and really fight for that decision. Yes. Can I add one, one thing to one of the slides? <clears throat> Ivy League schools aside, uh, right now, uh, our, and before the 70s, there were no women in medicine. There are no women MDs and there are no women veterinarians. That's right true. now, there are more women veterinarians than men entering school. Mm -hmm. Same, and it, it's, it's going to be that way soon in uh, medicine, human medicine, but men have fixed it so that they're in the, <clears throat> in the uh, specialties where they get the money. And my daughter, for instance, who's a pediatrician, gets paid a whole lot less. Mm -hmm. Fortunately, she's in the Department of Medicine, so she gets paid as much as a man. There you go. That's so important. it's still a big problem, even though it's 2022. Yeah, it is. And you know, it's an interesting, if you walk down the halls of UVM in the School of Medicine, you will see that you know there's a picture of every class that graduated mm -hmm. from the School of Medicine, and you see no women, one woman, two women, yeah. five women. So you see it in pictures if you yes, walk down the hall. I see it every day. So, so yeah. there you go. Um, thank you for sharing that. I have a yes, please. Um, quality is important. But Uh, yep, financial equality. Yep, but financial equity is important as well. Yep. Traditionally, men's jobs pay more. Mm -hmm. You know, from nurses and doctors. I won't say where I work, but the maintenance people earn a lot more money than I do for high school diplomas. I have a PhD, and then six people, a budget of a million dollars a year. It's traditionally maintenance is Right. Yeah, it, it is it is a problem that is that plagues us um, where you know you can paint those examples of you know women with PhDs making less. I don't know if everyone can hear her, women with a PhD making less than people with with then men with a high school diploma because of the, the job that they do and how that job is valued in society and because of what roles have traditionally been male and female. So that is a really big barrier that we all need to continue to, to work on and advance um, from whatever position we sit in, right? So thank you. Any other questions, comments? Anyone that bring up anything, anything for anyone else? <laughs> Good. Great. So you know what? There have been so many women breaking down barriers. And I found this great article of five, because I was like, oh my god, I could talk for, for ages about the fantastic women who have broken down barriers. But I found five. Let's see if you know any of these ones. So Maggie Lena Walker, anyone know her? No? So Maggie was the first woman to charter a bank, St. Luke's Penny Bank. And she really focused on women and minorities. And her bank was one of the few banks that survived the stock market crash of 1929. So she was doing things, supporting people that she believed in, teaching them how to save and invest, and she kept their money safe. You know, that was an, a feat. I don't know how she did that. I'd love to know it. Um, but that bank still exists today. It's merged with other banks to become the Consolidated Bank and Trust in Richmond, Virginia. So. Fabulous story, right? And she was born in 1864, 100 years before I was born. So lots of things that we women have been doing historically and can continue to do today. You guys are making me a little nervous. <laughs> <laughs> um, Madam C.J. Walker, anyone know her? What, what do you know about her? She uh, started a cosmetics company yeah. and, she, and became a millionaire. Yeah, yeah. So. She, she is featured in a Netflix show called Self Made. Oh, so if anyone amazing. has watched that, so that's Madam C.J. Walker. She was born in 1867 to enslaved parents on a cotton plantation. She was born as the name Sarah Breedlove, and she married and, and took her husband's name, and she became Madam Walker. And she had d issues with a scalp. She had a scalp condition, and she created products to address her issue, and it became widely popular. So her, her business was very popular. Um, her business has continued on, and she is remembered as being a pioneering black female entrepreneur who embraced financial independence and working from the ground up to build something, to fill a need in her community, right? So she was working to fill a need in her community, and other women had that same issue. This doesn't work really quickly. Louise Weiser, anybody know her? 
Mm, okay, so she became the first woman named as an, a president of an American bank. So she succeeded her husband, Horace Weiser, who served in the, a bank in Decorah, Iowa. And what's interesting about her, not only was she the first bank president, but she grew up in Vermont. So she was a Vermont girl, moved to Iowa, and became a bank president. So strong roots here in the state. How many people are, grew up in Vermont? Oh, awesome, great, all right. Um, fourth, Muriel Siebert, anybody know this name? She was the first woman of finance to have a seat on the New York Stock Exchange. One woman, 365 men. <laughs> Can you imagine? <laughs> I wonder if there is even a woman's room on the floor of the Stock Exchange, <laughs> right? Did she have to say, wait a second, boys, my turn, right? Um, she, had, she was a loud voice for equality. She changed jobs number of, a number of times because she knew she was not making what the men were. So to your point earlier, she had visibility to that and she, she, made, she, she made a change. She did what she needed to do to make a change. She went on to open her own brokerage firm and serve as superintendent of the uh, state of New York, um, of, for banking for the state of New York. And one of her quotes, I love this. It's a new one, it might show up in other of my presentations going forward. When a door is hard to open, if nothing else works, sometimes you have to rear back and kick it open, <laughs> even if you're wearing two inch high heels. <laughs> you know, like, and that's really, I think, the message that, that Pat Leahy and Janet Yellen were speaking to us today is while things have gotten better, they're not equitable. We're, we're not paying for value in our, in our world, and we need to break that down. And then the fifth woman, can you guess who it was? Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, so when I read this article, I'm like, oh, I have, to, I have to use these five women because it ends with Janet. You know, and you heard her qualifications today. You know, she's the first woman to hold the um, U.S. Treasury Secretary of the United States and the, have been the chair of the Board of Governors for the U.S. Federal Reserve and to have been on the Council of Economic Advisors. So she's a three-time winner, <laughs> the trifecta. And she's the first woman to hold all of those positions. And she's been widely applauded. You heard a lot of the, the accolades for her this morning. She's been widely applauded by economists around the world for her work for women and, and for the people of our country. So thank her. I, she kind of had to scoot out really quickly. I wanted to have an opportunity to say hello. I did have an opportunity to say hello to Pat Leahy. And the first time I met Pat Leahy, I worked on his 1986 campaign. So we had a little chat about that. So it was, yeah, I met him briefly back then. I'm sure he really rem remembers me. <laughs> but he was very gracious. <laughs> All right. So let's talk a little about financial coaching. Is anybody aware of what financial coaching is? It's kind, of, it's kind of a new profession. So financial coaches are people who have some experience, uh, whether that be personal experience, some credentials, like you know my financial coaching academy, Liz's credentials, where we just we help people look at their money, however that is, right? So we're not advisors. We're not telling you where to put it in stock. We're not helping you invest it. We're helping you to get ready to do that. We're helping you put the budgets together, looking at your the big picture of your finances and helping you to, to see how that relates to your life and the life you want to live, the life you have today and, and where you're going in the future. We help you with education and encouragement to help reduce that, fin that financial stress that, that women, really women feel financial stress a lot more than men. We'll cover that in a little bit. Um, but having someone there to have your back can really help you look at things differently, can give you a different perspective, can provide some education and encouragement that we all need. Um, and it's, it's also, I think, in our generation, we are one of the first generations where it's okay to talk about money, right? It wasn't when we were growing up, right? It was not okay to talk about money, but now it's more, it's, it's a topic that can be open, and you may not want to say, you know, I make this much money, but you may want to say, I'm, I'm dealing with this particular issue. Do you have any suggestions? Like, and really open up those conversations to people like myself, to Liz and her team, and other people in your life that, are, that, are, um, that support you and want to help support you. 
to you know do things like establish and accomplish your goals, whether they be um, that you want to create an emergency fund, or some of you are talking about retirement and feeling comfortable about being able to take that step, right? And as you're early on in your career, thinking about, okay, what do I want to do in the future? How do I want to live my life? And what do I need to do to get there, right? So those are the things that financial coaches can do, as well as help you understand your mindset about financial matters, whether you have an abundance mindset or a scarcity mindset, and, and help, to, to help you find ways to address those things, and to also work with you and other professionals to support your goals. So, I often work with my clients with their accountant, with their lawyer, with their financial advisor, so that you know we're all on the same page as to, to what's happening in that person's life. And your, your, your accountant might be TurboTax, or it might be HR Block, but it's helping you to understand your financial world and the tax impact, especially as you're re, um, repro approaching retirement. I call that the decumulation phases of our portfolios, right? We spend a lot of time accumulating, and then as we hit retirement, we, we want to make sure we decumulate in a way that is tax efficient and that supports our lives and our goals in retirement. So a little bit about financial wellness. So financial wellness is a, a topic, or it is a definition you can find on the internet. So the definition I like to use is, that financial wellness is a state of financial well-being in which you can pay your debts and provide for your current needs so you can take care of the needs that we all have, right? We have them, food, shelter, transportation, medical, that we can weather unexpected emergencies and life transitions. We don't know what life's gonna hand us, you know? We, 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 we hope we can plan for things, but something always comes up. So having that emergency fund and the ability to weather a life transition to be able to plan for your long-term goals, whether that's you know, retiring in this beautiful state that, that we live in, or maybe you want to retire to to a place where it's a little bit warmer in the winter. <laughs> Depends on whether you embrace that cross-country skiing that Pat Lee talked about. <laughs> um, and also to be able to make choices that allow you to enjoy our life. We work because we're supporting ourselves and our family, and we want to have some joy. We want to have our friends and family over for dinner, we want to take a vacation, or whatever it is that brings you joy, you want to make sure that there's, there's time and the finances available to do those things. And also to be at peace with your financial decision making. So to know that you're doing the best job that you can with what you have, and to manifest other ways that, that finances can, um, or income can come in for you. So, that's my definition of financial wellness. Any questions, comments, anything you'd add to that? Does that resonate with people? Okay. Is it sequential? Do you have to have bullet point one before you can get to bullet point two? Absolutely not. You can do them all at one time. <laughs> <laughs> they are not sequential. Very good question. Good. There's really not a lot about finances that are sequential. Um, other than you have to have some money before you spend it. <laughs> There's a little bit of that. Although credit cards, don't get me started on those, have uh, changed that a little bit. So I always like to say you have to have income before you spend it. <laughs> um, so this is a, a, the um, results of a survey completed by PricewaterhouseCoopers. And um, they, were, they did a survey of employees to find out what financial wellness um, and what the impact of financial wellness had on people. And 34% of the respondents said that the lack of financial wellness impacted their mental health. It, impact, it impacted their sleep. It impacted their self-esteem and their physical health. Worrying about money has so many impacts. And one of the joys to me about financial coaching, I was, I was working with this couple who were who are 70, in their 70s, they had a lot of credit card debt, living on Social Security, and we needed to, to create a plan to, to address all of that. And as we sat down and started talking over a couple of months, they said to me, do you know how much stress you have taken out of our life just to have someone to look at this with us, to partner with us, mm -hmm. to, to show us a different way of doing things? Because they were of that generation that it wasn't okay to talk about money, so they didn't talk about it with their family when they needed help. So it's, an, it's important that we understand that and that we understand the impact that it has on us so that 
we reach out for help, whether it's to your neighbor, your friend, your sister, a colleague, to get that help you need. So why does financial wellness matter specifically for women? So, you know, we heard Pat Leahy, women are earning more on average than we ever have before. In the first study that was done in 1967, women were earning 59 cents on the dollar. Today, it's about 89 to 90% for white women. It is not the same for women of color. It is worse for black women and even worse for Latina women. So it, we are earning more, but the, but the equity gap needs to go away. And the pay for value needs to be addressed. Women are still earning significantly less than their, their male counterparts. We talked about that, you know, if you are in a job where you're the same role, um, there are some things that have come into place. There was a, a really underreported uh, legislation that happened under Barack Obama called the Pay Transparency Act. I don't know if anyone heard of it. Yeah, so it was the Pay Transparency Act. In companies, and in fact, when I was a manager at companies, if people talked about their salary, it was grounds for termination. It is not that anymore. And companies are looking at their books and really going through them and bringing everybody in the same job to the same level. So the last company that I worked for, I was part of that team where we were looking at everyone across the board and bringing people up to the same level um, so that same job, regardless of gender, regardless of national origin, was the same pay. So that is something that, that is being addressed. Companies don't have to do that. Um, I believe it's still voluntary, but people are stepping up and taking that, that step. Women live longer and we take time off from the workforce, right? We take time off from the workforce if we have children. Sometimes we're in that they call sandwich generation where we're still raising children and our parents might be aging. So it's a really hard time to work. And especially with the pandemic, that was a really hard time for women to work if they didn't have flexibility. Um, so making sure that at, at, in our younger years that we start those good habits of putting money into our retirement and understanding how the impact that has of time value of money and, and interest rates and compounding interest rates. So as things, um, so getting money in early, starting to save early and continuing that throughout your lifetime is really important. Liz will talk a little bit about that. Women are also a little bit more emotional about their finances than men. We, we, we feel the stress, and that's what I mean about emotional. But we also make decisions from um, an emotional perspective, right? So if you had to choose between um, investing and feeding your kids, you're always going to choose feeding your kids, right? Um, but we also look at our, our community. So a lot of us, um, I know a lot of my, my friends and peers, we specifically shop at a co-op or we specifically stop at the farmer's stand and buy our meat and our dairy and vegetables and things like that because we want to support our local communities. We want to make sure that in Vermont where we have such access to great agriculture that we're supporting that agriculture and that we're feeding our families with local food grown here, supporting the farmer, supporting the person who delivers it. It's creating that economic opportunity for all of us. So really thinking about that. And I think women think a little bit more about that. It's a personal opinion. And the last um, item or number of why financial wellness matters for women is because at some point, 90% of us will be solely responsible for our finances. How many people have been, how many of us in here have been solely responsible for your finances? <laughs> yep. So whether you married late, I didn't get married until I was 47. Um, whether you um, have been divorced, whether you've been widowed, I know we have a few uh, people who have been widowed in here, you will at some point become solely responsible for your money. And true fact, more money in the United States will be in the hands of women in the next five years than ever before in our lifetime due to generational wealth. Um, due to many economic factors. So it, we owe it to ourselves, to our families, to our communities, and to, the, to our greater you know, United States and the world 
to be comfortable, to be confident, and to be competent with how we manage our portion of that, right? Anybody disagree with me on that? <laughs> All right. So here are the five components of financial wellness. So income, we talked about that. You have to provide for your current needs. How many people in here have a job where you go to a job and have a paycheck? How many people in here are business owners? How many people do both? Both. 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 Yeah. Yeah. So there are lots of ways that you can have income. You can have a job. You can have a side hustle. You can um, babysit. You can um, volunteer. You can work at your local co-op if you want. Um, so there are lots of ways that you can create income. You can have real estate and have income coming in from that real estate. And that's one way that I was able to start to really build some, um, some financial, a really strong financial foundation for myself and my family was through real estate. Um, purchasing my own home at 29 certainly was really helpful. Um, savings, savings can help us weather those unexpected financial emergencies and enjoy life. And these, these are not sequential either, so you can do all of these at one time. Um, <laughs> So savings, you know, putting some money aside into emergency funds. So if your car breaks down, I remember the first time <laughs> I bought my first car and like at least once a month, it broke down. <laughs> so I learned a lot about having a, a, a little emergency fund because I needed it every month uh, to fix my car. And so it's important that we, that we, that we set some money aside, that we have some, some um, money that we can use for emergencies if we have them, and also to enjoy our life. Right to set some money aside for vacation, or if our favorite holiday is Halloween. Do you know how many people love Halloween? It's their favorite, and they spend a lot of money at Halloween. <laughs> so putting putting some money aside for those things, um, spending, being able to pay your debts from a solid budget. So being able to understand how you spend, what you spend your money on, aligning your spending with your values, like we talked about, shopping in your local community rather than at a large um, consolidator. And investing. Investing helps you plan for those long-term financial goals and transitions and helps you to enjoy your life. And legacy is, is building something that outlasts us and it's creating that financial peace. And legacy can also happen right at the same time. So one of the things that um, my husband and I have done, I, I read this book um, called Die With Zero. <laughs> Some of us, that's not our goal, but um, we, we want to make sure that we've got enough to get there. But why do we wait until we die to give it to someone who needs it today? So we've picked one person from each of our families who needs some help today, and we provide them some financial support. It's not a lot, but it makes a difference in their life today. And so, you know, we've made that commitment to, you know, why wait until, you know, if I'm projecting another 30 years, my, my niece who I'm helping is going to be 65 herself at that time. Like, why would I wait to help her? She'll be through, you know, all the accumulation stage. So, so those are the things that we can do. We can start to build that legacy today um, to make sure that it's there for the future and for whatever we want to give it to. Please. All righty. Well, thank you, Lori. I, I, a couple of things that Lori said um, I wanted to comment on. One was uh, her comment about um, women being demoted when they, were, uh, when they became pregnant. I kid you not, I worked at a job in the mid-90s where women did get demoted when they got pregnant. <laughs> and you know, I just remember being shocked, going, really? This is, this is really happening? Um, so we definitely, um, as women, and I'm the only woman on my select board, and uh, I've been on the select board for, for 10 years. There had been another woman, but recently we had someone who, um, who left midterm, so we have to appoint someone. And I was the only one who uh, nominated the two very intelligent um, women who uh, were running for the open seat. Um, and I was the only one who voted for them. And a man was voted in. And you know, I, it just was very like today, like this was 2022, right? Um, so we definitely have um, some gaps to, to, to close um, in that regard. Um, so the next section that we're gonna be talking about is really looking at some of that stuff that Lori just showed in the previous slide is like knowing your numbers, right? 
Um, and uh, so we're going to start with, um, these are the things that, that when you're thinking about you and your own personal finance, um, your net worth, which I'm going to go into some detail about what net worth is, your credit score and why it's important to have a healthy credit score to improve your personal finance, taking a look at your family budget. That's often the first thing that we do when we're uh, working with someone in financial coaching is really sitting down with them so that we know what's the money in, what's the money out. Um, and then what is your debt load? And then finally, um, we're gonna touch on some retirement funding as well. Okay, so we're gonna start out with what net worth really is. Um, so it essentially is your assets, what you have in the positive, minus your debts, what you have in the negative. So these are what you might include in your assets. Your checking and savings account balances, any investments you have, retirement account balances, your car's value can be included in net worth, your house value if you're a homeowner, and potentially some other assets that you might have. Um, versus your debts. So what are your outstanding loan balances on your credit cards, um, your car loan, your home, you might have a home equity loan, um, you might have student loans, personal loans, loans to family and friends. So you take what you have in the positive and you subtract your debts and that becomes um, your net worth. And it can be positive or negative. Um, so here's an example of um, an example of Rosie, who is age 32. Her assets, she has a house of value of $375,000. So if she were to sell her house today, it would be $375,000. Her car is worth $12,000. She's got a pop-up camper worth $4,000. She has $6,000 in her savings account and $15,000 in her retirement. But for her debts, she still owes $325,000 on the home. She has a car loan balance that's actually higher than what the car is worth, because that's often the case when you have a car loan, that it's worth uh, less than what you actually owe on the, on the car. Um, she has student loans of $65,000. She's got a $4,000 credit. And she owes her parents who helped her with the down payment, she owes them $20,000. So her debts are $427,000 and her assets, because we're including the value of the home, are four hundred and twelve. dollars So her net worth is negative. And I can tell you there's probably people in this room who have a negative net worth, especially if you're younger and you have something like student loans, right? You just probably don't have enough money in your savings account. You may not be a homeowner and your net worth is going to be negative. And that's just very common, when you're, especially when you're young and you're starting out. Um, here's an example of um, the positives. So we have Samira and Jan who are in their 60s. So their house value is 425, they've got a car, they've got some checking, and they've got um, a bit more than Rosie did in her retirement savings. For their debt, they don't own on their home anymore, but they do have a home equity loan and they do have a car loan balance. So their debts are only 45,000, but their assets are 775, so they have a net worth of 730,000. So you'll, you'll see that you know, as you're, when you start out younger, your net worth's probably gonna be in the negative. Um, in fact, here's a little slide. So in this case, you know, you might have, because of student loans or other debts that you have, you might be in the yeah. negative. And as you go, as you get older and you're building assets, particularly through retirement savings and home ownership, um, by the time you retire at age 65, 70, that's when you start to spend. And then Lori had mentioned the legacy, right? There might be something left over here to pass on to your family or to pass on to charity. Um, or there might not be, right? So you, it, it, it really depends on how long you live and obviously how much you've saved. So this is sort of a typical um, uh, example of what net worth might look like. Anyone have any questions on that? Okay. So you can do this, yeah, oh sorry, yes. Would you typically can, like, calculate net worth like, as a couple together or individual? Um, you would probably do it as a couple together, um, and and uh, you know if you're commingling your your assets. Um, the um, the other thing um, that I was going to say is uh, sorry. Oh, sorry. I was gonna say, no, no, no. That, that, that that's okay. <laughs> So the next thing is your credit score. 
Um, does, any, does everyone here know what your credit score is? Yeah? Okay. Um, if you don't, I, I did, I think I believe I offered in the um, actual like d greater description that if you wanted to have your credit score pulled, we can do that at Capstone for you and all you'll need to do is just uh, give me your name and I can get in touch with you to be able to do that. Um, but a credit score is really important in terms of your ability to build your, your net worth. Um, and again, home ownership, right? Car ownership, getting a car so you can get to a job, right? So in order for you to have good credit, um, there's, there's a lot of factors that sort of go into um, to a credit score. But in terms of where you want to be, you want to be up here in these greens, right? Um, and it's not like you start out low when you're younger, right? When you first start out, and let's say you have a student loan, um, and maybe you have your first credit card, you're probably somewhere in the high 600s to low 700s for your credit score. And in order to get up to sort of the 800s, that often takes time, that's age. Um, I'm gonna go through a little bit um, about the, the credit scores here. Um, so it really does affect your ability to borrow um, for these large purchases, like a home or a car. Um, a lower credit score means you're going to get um, a, a higher interest rate on a loan. So for example, um, if you have a low credit score that's down here, it's unlikely that you're going to be able to qualify for a mortgage because there's a lot of reasons why you have a low credit score. Um, that's going to make you a risk to the lender and a house is a big risk. However, you, could, you will be able to get a car loan with a score like this. But the difference is, is that your car loan's gonna be around 17 to 20%. Vermont has a cap of 20% on what a car loan can be. Other states have even higher interest rates. But it can mean the difference of someone with good credit and a five-year car loan paying something like maybe two to $3,000 in interest versus a person with poor credit who's often lower income getting a seven-year loan at a 17% and paying $13,000 in interest. So it really is, it, it is it's dramatic, the amount of money that you pay. And what makes it even more difficult for people to understand is that the person on the five-year car loan with the low interest rate has the same monthly payment as the person with the high interest rate and the seven-year loan because of how loans work. So they put people in, yes, you can afford a $250 or $300 car loan, but it's going to cost you $13,000 versus a $300 car loan costing you two or $3,000. So some people don't know also that credit scores affect your insurance premiums. So, so for home, for auto, and for life. So if you are someone with a low credit score, your insurance premiums are going to be higher because you are simply a higher risk to them. Um, if, you have, uh, if you have a low credit score, you are, you are truly more likely to be in a car accident than someone with a high credit score, which is why they increase those premiums, because the actuaries tell them that. Um, and that's, that's uh, how they do the math. Um, it can also affect your ability to get a job. So not, most jobs don't check credit scores, but if you were to be working for like a financial institution, they may check your credit score. So you wanna make sure that if you are doing a job like that, you at least go in knowing what your credit score is. Um, and it's certainly considered when you're renting an apartment. So if you're looking to rent an apartment, oftentimes the minimum score that they're gonna want is a 680 for renting an apartment. In fact, um, and this, this goes back to you know, wanting to have good credit, my children are um, you know, college kids, right? And they're renting apartments because there's no housing. Well, who has to sign for that? Me, right? And I have to have good credit for my kids to be able to rent an apartment while they're in college. So it's not just you know, necessarily, oh, I don't need to rent an apartment. Your kid may need to, or your kid may need to get a student loan that you have to co-sign on. And it truly does. Having a good credit score offers a lifetime of of savings um, and um, and if you don't have good credit it's a lifetime of higher expenses and a, a serious impact on your net worth. So I'm just going to quickly go through 
how to build and maintain a great credit score. So the nice thing is, is that credit scores do change, right? They, they can go up, but they can also go down. So even if you have a poor credit score now, there is opportunity to grow your credit score and improve your credit score. Equally, if you have a great credit score now, there are ways that it can very quickly go down um, if, if a few things happen. So in terms of what makes up a credit score, so those numbers that you saw, like the 780 to 850, um, the, the biggest impact on your credit score is your payment history, which means uh, do you pay on time? Um, and on time doesn't mean necessarily the day that it's due. Um, so let's say, I know for example, mortgages, right? They'll say the due date is, you know, um, the 15th of every month, but you have until the 30th to make your payment, right? And when I was young and sort of naive, I was like, oh, wait until the 30th to pay my mortgage because I don't have to, right? Um, where meanwhile, so that, that wasn't considered a late payment. Um, all they were doing was earning more interest on me, right? Because I was waiting a couple weeks to make my payment. Um, but really, in order for it to nick your credit score, to make your credit score go down, um, you have to be more than 30 days late. So if you're just a few days late, you may get a late fee from your credit card company that's $35, $40 because you were late on your payment, but it's not going to affect your credit score. It, it, it is a 30-day um, or, or higher. And that can make your credit score fall by like 60 points in one month just by, by having a 30-day late payment. Um, the other factor is the amounts owed. So this really has to do with um, what, what do you have as outstanding balances on loans, but also your credit utilization. Um, so let's say you have um, two credit cards and a bank line of credit. So you have a credit card for 5,000, you have a credit card for 2,000, and you have a line of credit for 1,000 on your checking account. So that's five, seven, eight, eight thousand dollars is your full credit limit. And you never really touch your credit, um, your, your uh, overdraft protection, um, and you use the $2,000 one for emergencies, and so you know, you're only using that $5,000 one. Um, your whole credit limit is, is 8,000, and what you wanna do to keep your credit healthy is to use no more than 30% of that credit limit. So that would be five times um, three is 1,500. Um, so you wouldn't want to have more than fifteen hundred dollars overall. In, no, I'm sorry, eight hundred, eight thousand is your is your um, credit limit. So eight times three is twenty four. So twenty four hundred would be the maximum amount that you would want to have charged on all three of those those credit lines, um, because that's thirty percent of your whole credit limit, eight thousand dollars. So it's not per credit card. It's really per your entire credit limit. Um, the golden rule is around 8%. So 30% is, you know, you, it's, it's a safe amount, but you really want to try to keep your credit um, utilization to be around 10 to 8% of your entire credit limit. Yes? So is that, the, is that um, debt to income? Is that what that? Um, so that's different, actually. So debt to income is, um, that, and that's a good question. Um, debt to income is how much debt um, is safe for you to have compared to your overall gross income. And that is around, I think I actually mentioned it in here, um, if I talk about debt. I think that that's around 45% of your gross income should be all debt. And that includes housing, whether you're renting or you own, and all of your other loans. And the reason that that number is there, because some people are higher than that, right, is because you won't have money to spend on everything else that you need to spend on. Food, clothing, pets, transportation, heating, all the things that you need to live, 45% is really the max that you want to have. And a safer amount is more like 40 to 42%. I think I talk about that a little bit. But this is really about, so you'll find that like, let's say you get a brand new car, right? And um, you have a car loan of $30,000. Um, that's going to actually make your credit go down a little bit because you suddenly have this big balance, right? But as you pay your car loan down and like four years in, you're down to like, you know, $7,000, your credit score is going to go up as long as you keep making on-time payments. 
Um, your credit score, if you max out your credit cards and you're just typically, even if you pay them off in full every month, if you're using all of your credit, you'll see your credit score go down because you're, you're using all of your credit. And credit cards um, love to loan you money, but they also, and they love for you to pay only the minimum, but they also want you to make payments um, to your credit card. So, so they will, um, if, if a car company sees, or a mortgage in particular, if you're looking to purchase a house, you wanna make sure that your credit card balances are down because that's gonna affect them giving you a loan. Because if they see that you have cr high credit limit, they may um, reduce the amount that they loan to you or they may not loan to you at all until you get your credit card balances down. Yes? Is there a detriment to credit scores to having a credit card and not using it? No, in fact, um, I always tell people um, if you, so maybe you got your first credit card in college, right, and you never use it. Having that is actually, this goes into the credit length, 15% of your credit score is based on how long you've had credit. So if you close, like it's funny, I'm in my 50s, and they say that the, my lowest reason for my score to be lower than it, than it is is because of my length of credit history and that's because I paid off my mortgage and I don't have an old credit card anymore so I look like I'm young in the credit system even though I'm not even though I've had credit since I was 21 um, so things sort of fall off your credit um, report after a while um, and um, and so your length your your, your credit length um, I mentioned earlier, younger people tend to not have the super high scores because they're just young. They haven't been in the system long enough. Um, and so as you get older, as long as you're making your payments on time and you're not getting too many loans, because that's another thing, um, type of credit, right? So one credit card isn't gonna get you an 800 credit score, but having a variety of credit, so whether that's a mortgage, um, a personal loan, a car loan, a student loan, those are varieties of credit. Some are credit lines, like a credit card. Some are, are installment loans, like a car or a mortgage are considered installment loans. And they all sort of weigh differently too, right? A house weighs a little bit more because it's a bigger responsibility than say a credit card. Um, a car um, will, uh, will, will be helpful for you if you've never really had a lot of credit, that can boost your credit loan because that's also a big responsibility playing for a car. So types of credit um, impact your, your credit score. Um, and then the final thing is, how often are you applying for credit? Um, so new credit. Um, has anyone gone to apply for a car loan recently? No, well if you did, you would, if you had your credit score looked at, you would see that it, they had like seven different inquiries because they were going to seven different credit unions and banks to see how can I get the best, um, how can I get the best rate for this person. Um, and that would actually impact your credit score negatively temporarily until you got your loan and then um, once you start to make payments, your credit score would go back up. So those are sort of temporary things. But what they really raise red flags on are people who are jumping from bank to bank looking for a loan and getting rejected, right? Those are the kinds of things that will cause your credit score to go down. Um, so th that's really what makes up your, your score. And simple things like bringing down your, um, your balance um, on credit cards can boost your score very quickly. Like in a month, from a previous month to the next month, you can see your score go up if you've, if you've reduced your credit card balances. I remember seeing someone's score, because um, I've looked at hundreds of credit scores, um, go up by 100 points just from uh, their student loan being in deferment, and then it went into its first month of payment, like that a payment was due, and they had made their first payment, their score jumped by 100 points, which I'd never seen. But there's, so there's, there's ways um, that, that you can uh, take steps to improve your, your credit if it's not. Um, Liz, there's some questions? Oh, sure, yeah, sorry. Uh, yes. Why is it that like the way that they look at your credit score is different? Like there's like the hard look or the soft look? Yes, that's a good question. Why? Why is that different? Um, because there's there's something called um, a soft inquiry and a, and a hard inquiry. So a soft inquiry is like if you were to come to me and say, 
Liz, could you pull my credit report? I have a, a contract with TransUnion, who's one of the, the three credit bureaus. I pull your credit report. It's for informational purposes only. Same thing with Credit Karma. You may have an account with Credit Karma. You can pull your credit every day. It's you looking at your credit in order to you know, see how you're doing, how you can improve. Whereas a hard inquiry is actually looking for a loan. And so when you're looking for a loan, that is an immediate red flag that you need money, right? And so that's why it's considered, um, that's why your credit score can go down because it's like, oh, suddenly Liz needs money. Liz doesn't have money, she needs to borrow money, right? And it could be a completely legitimate reason why I need to borrow money. I may just want to get a new credit card because I get points on it, right? Or I may be looking to purchase a home, right? And those are legitimate reasons but they raise a red flag that you're looking to borrow. And so immediately your credit score will just go down a tad. Now, if, if I were doing that over and over again, because I kept getting rejected by banks, that's an even bigger flag. Liz is desperate for money, right? And so we have to lower her credit score because we, we don't know her at all. We don't know where she, you know, we can look up where she lives, but we don't know her personality. We don't know anything about her except for her credit score and that is sort of a universal number that is shared among banks for them to say, is this person a risk? It's all about risk. But why is it any different than me looking at Credit Karma and then that being able to like, tell me what my score is? Because you're not, you're not asking for money. You're just looking at your, your score. So when uh, a hard inquiry is when, when you go to the bank to make you know, you're, you're looking to get a credit card or you're looking. So it's, it's really, um, it's just for informational purposes for you and you're not looking for money when you do your own credit karma or you come to me. Um, but if you go to a bank, you're looking for money. Is that, so, I'm so sorry. Is That's that, okay. Uh, because, so I went to open a, a bank account, um, a separate one for my business, and is that like because they're looking at all the different cards you have or different you have is it, like I just I just don't understand like what why it's so different like I get that they're looking at it but I guess I don't understand like why it's um, so different for them to look at my score or the me to look at my score yeah, oh, there's no difference in the score they're going to okay. see the same score they're going right. to see the same exact report it's just if they're looking at it now if you were just opening a bank account and not like a, you might have done a line of credit or something like that for your business. No, it was just a, it was just a Okay, bank if it was just a bank account, they weren't running your credit. They were running, they, they might have been if you were at a brand new bank doing something called check systems, which is like a bank's credit report. Um, but that's not, that doesn't have any effect on your credit score, like your regular FICO score is what it's called. Um, or Vantage, that's what Credit Karma uses is Vantage. They're both just scoring um, mechanisms, companies that do scores. So they're seeing the same exact thing that you're seeing, um, but they're seeing that through, they're, they're just looking at it to, if they're, if they're looking at your credit score because you're getting a line of credit for your checking account or something like that, they're looking to see is, is you know, um, Sabrina gonna pay her money back, right? Is she, is she a risk to us? If we give her a $10,000 line of credit, can we trust that she's gonna pay that back? And so they'll look at your credit score. Um, in order to, uh, to determine whether or not to give you that 10000 But if you're just opening an account, they're not pulling your credit score for that purpose. But if you're applying for car insurance, they are, right? Because they, they have to set the premium, right? And they'll say, and you don't necessarily know that you've agreed to this, but you have at some point agreed over the phone or in your application that you can have a, a credit score. And that's also, um, uh, that, that isn't a hard inquiry because that doesn't necessarily lower your score, but it does have an impact on what your premium is going to be. Yeah, so I think the, the full is a soft and a hard inquiry are looking at the same score. A soft inquiry won't negatively impact, a hard inquiry may. So that's sort of the... May lower your score slightly. Yeah. A few points. It's not, it's not a big deal. Yes? Um, I was advised to freeze access to my credit scores when I'm older, mm -hmm. which I did. And I know how to unfreeze it, but just say I need to get a new car. Is that going to adversely affect me, that, that they've been frozen? No, you would just need to give permission to unfreeze them um, so, that they could, so that they could look at your, your credit score. 
Um, I know when they, when they first started that, it was a little hard to fr unfreeze that, you know, thaw them. I don't know what the word would be. Um, <laughs> thaw your credit score. Um, but yeah, that's, it's not a bad thing to do, but it does become like if you wanted to even look at your own credit score, you might not be able to until you unfreeze it. Why would you freeze it? Because there's a lot of breaches. Yeah, there's a lot of, you know, people. Yeah, and you know, I, I guess I'm I'm not one for freezing my credit score, my credit report, um, only because I just feel like my whole world is out there, right? Everything's electronic in my life, yeah. and you know, my credit score probably isn't. I mean, I know I, you'll get letters that say we've been breached, right? Probably every one of us has had something that's been breached before. Um, I did actually just have um, someone use my ATM card in Poland. Um, and took money out of my account, but I got it all back. And that was a whole different story. That was, I didn't even have, I was in Poland, but I did not have a credit card there. I did not have my bank account there. And so it was just a very weird um, situation that happened with my bank. But, um, but anyway, those are, um, those are, uh, that's, that's a good question. But yeah, you have to unfreeze it. Did someone else have a You can also do things like a mandatory match on social security numbers. So um, in the 90s, right before, 90, right before the year 2000, I went to get a car loan because I, I wanted to keep my credit fresh and I thought, well, I, I could pay for this car or, or I could just uh, get a car loan just to keep my credit fresh. I was denied in seconds. I was like, what? <laughs> I pulled my credit report and there were two Lori Woods that lived in a similar address. One with bankruptcy and one with really good credit. So it took me six months to clean that up. So it's really important to pull your credit report and make sure that the things that are on there are yours um, because it does take some time to clean them up. So pull it, do that soft inquiry and understand it because you can be negatively impacted, and it took me a while to fix it. Yeah, and that yeah, that's an unfortunate story, but it's not actually rare, right? right. You do see sometimes, and the other thing that can happen too is that, um, and generally, the the fraud that happens on credit reports is through family, right? So it's it's someone in your family who's who's applying for a loan um, in your name, and then they end up not. Um, that's another thing about credit that I didn't mention here. Here's some of the things that I just talked about. They came through on the, the bullet points. Um, is that uh, I always say co-sign with a caution, right? Like I have co I guess I'm co-signing my son's apartments, right? <laughs> I was the one who's filled out the application for him. And um, you know, and so um, just just be sure that like if you're co-signing, especially sometimes people will do this for children to get them started, um, that if they are late in their payments, that negatively affects you too. You equally own the loan. Um, that you co-signed with. And I always, I work with a lot of um, single uh, women and um, they would often get into situations with boyfriends where they would co-sign on something and then the boyfriend would leave and the sad story would be, well, I, you know, he took the car too and I still owe on it, right? And so, um, so just be uh, really careful um, about co-signing and trust the person and know that there's, a, there's always a risk. Yes. Do you, um, do you advise loan consolidation if you're trying to like lower some of your um, interest rates? Yeah, sure. How does Did, that affect your credit? Um, so anytime you apply for a loan, there is sort of a, a, a slight negative impact. And, um, and, and if you have a lot of credit cards you're, and, and you have high balances on them, your credit score is probably not terribly high. It's probably in the 600s, as long as you're making on-time payments. Um, so some people do play that game of like, let's transfer over to 0%. Um, you just have to be really careful when you do that. One company that I do recommend to folks who have really high credit um, is called, it's a, non, it's a nonprofit debt consolidation company called GreenPath. And GreenPath um, is a company that will um, basically, uh, they'll, they'll review what you have in all your outstanding credit cards. They'll even do car loans. They'll do loans and collections, they'll take on anything that you have that you need to sort of pull together. And they come up with a plan for you to pay it all off within three to five years. And you make the payment to them and they distribute those payments to the creditors. And they've negotiated plans with the creditors. So they've helped lower interest rates. Um, there is a monthly fee for Green Path, but the amount that you save um, compared to what you would be doing if you were just paying the minimum and paying those high interests on credit cards, 
um, is is so much less. Um, it's thousands and thousands it of dollars less. Like credit score? Yeah, a little bit, yeah. But it, yeah. To, I always say to people, that should be the least of your worries. I'd rather save $10,000 and have my credit score go down, right? Or, or I don't want to be a, you know, I don't want to be paying these credit cards for the next 15 years. Um, so Green Path is definitely a healthy way to, and a reputable, and there's a couple of them out there that are called debt consolidation versus debt settlement. Debt settlement is totally different. You don't want to necessarily get involved in that, but a debt consolidation company can, can help you. Yes? If you look them up online, is it trustworthy that they're who they say they are? Um, you, you probably want to double check with someone, but they, they're, like, there are lists of like, who's accepted in the state, like that, that, that the state will allow business to be done. But I'll tell you, there are hundreds and hundreds of them that Vermont will allow to use. And no, so, but I meant oh, Green Path specifically. Uh, oh, you'll find them on, on the web. They have a, it's like greenpath.org. Or no, dot com. I forget if it's org or com. I think it's probably org. Um, but uh, you'll, you'll, you'll find it right away. I, I would say yes. Usually, just, you probably already know this, but make sure when you're looking at your URL, like when you're looking at the website, that there's the locked thing there. Um, and that if you hover over it, there isn't something hidden underneath there, that's a different mm -hmm. address. But those are safe ways to make sure that, especially when you get those emails, it's like, oh, wait, I work with that person. And then you hover over it, it's like, um, no, I don't work with that person. <laughs> that's asking me to go rush them to the bank with money, right? I have a question. I think we have a yes. more questions, yeah. Um, I have a 19-year-old grandson mm -hmm. who is buying a car soon. Yeah. He doesn't want to finance it. He wants okay. to take the money out of his savings account. Mm -hmm. He has a debit card, not a credit card, so I'm sure he has no credit yep. score at this point. Um, how can he build credit? That's a great question. So building credit, um, you can start when you're young. You can also sort of rebuild credit, or if you've never had credit before, you can start at any age. Um, so building credit is, uh, is either one, just sort of taking out your first loan, um, and that you know usually requires you to have a job. Actually, it always does, right? Require except for a student loan. <laughs> you don't have to have a job to get a student loan. Um, but uh, is is to is to um, have a job. Um, one way that's an easy way to start is through something called a credit builder loan. Um, credit unions offer them. Uh, essentially, it's where he could put like anywhere from a hundred dollars, like to five hundred dollars, in a savings account becomes a secured account, and then the, ba the bank or credit union will loan him that money back. And then he'll make monthly payments, you know, that include some interest um, to pay back that secured loan. Another option is a secured credit card. So as little as $500, he would put down as a security um, deposit, and, um, and then he could uh, use the credit card the trick, though, is if you have a $500 credit card, what did I say was the rule of how much percentage you don't want to use? Yeah, like 30%. So no more than 30%, which would be um, $150, right? So a 19-year-old, if you trust them with only spending $150 on their credit card, you probably don't. So usually, you know, you kind of got to gauge, like, is this person ready for a credit card? And if they're not, a secured loan is, is a really good way to start. Um, do you have some thoughts? Well, they can also, um, so if you trust the younger person, <laughs> I do. they can start to piggyback on your credit. So if you have a credit card and you add that younger person as an authorized user and they use it, they start to assume some of your credit. So, but you get the negative hit if there's a problem. So, but you'll also get the bill. So you can monitor and see what's happening. So there are ways, along with what Liz talked about, to start helping those younger people. Maybe a credit card that you haven't used for a long time, maybe you're having them use one of those and making sure that it gets paid off every month. Um, you know, just charging your gas and paying it. And trick is, you don't have to wait until you get the bill to pay it. So you can use a credit card like a debit card. You charge something, you immediately go and pay it. Charge it, go and pay it. And you pay a lot less interest if you pay your credit cards that way. And pay it in full every month, right? Yes. So you just want to make sure you pay it in full every month. Um, because you, otherwise, if you don't, that next cup of coffee that you charge on your credit card 
is going to be starting from the day you charge it. It's just going to be earning that 17, 21% interest rate. So you definitely, if you have credit card balances, try to avoid using them if you can until you've paid them down because you're just immediately on the next purchase you're you're starting to pay interest. There's no more grace period on your purchases. Um, and in the interest of time, I don't, I don't want to rush through things because we do want to give you time for the activity and also just continue to ask questions. The next thing we're going to talk about is, is a part of your you know, financial wellness is your budget. So knowing your family budget. Lori's going to be sharing, um, I think, some handout budget handouts or we can email them to you. Emergency fund. Yeah, we're going to, okay. we're going to go through the okay. setting. Yeah. yeah, so this is just an example of a budget that I use when I'm working with a client. Um, so there's, there's, I'm going to go through sort of three pages but the, the first page is sort of what are your everyday monthly expenses, right? We all have groceries, we all have rent or mortgage, we've got our cell phone, we've got heat that we might pay for gas for the car, car loan, car insurance, child care, all that kind of stuff. Um, so those are your regular monthly expenses. Um, and so in this case, the total monthly expenses for this family comes to 3065 every month. But then I also like to not forget those yearly expenses. Like in about a month, someone's gonna deliver my firewood and I'm gonna have to pay them $900, right? So I don't have to do that every month, but I do need to make sure that I have that in my yearly expenses. So in this case, they've got a cat, so you don't wanna forget about pet care. Um, they've got you know one camp that they pay for their kids. There's the Christmas and holidays. Um, there's tires, right? Those are all those big expenses that we don't necessarily even do every year, but we wanna budget for them. Um, car maintenance. At a minimum, I tell people put $1,500, right? And that's usually not even enough, right? Um, at this point, it's probably $2,500 um, would be a minimum for one car. Um, so you wanna make sure that you have those things in your yearly budget. So in this case, for the yearly expenses, this person comes to just under $400 a month that they should you know, technically set aside, right? Because those things are gonna happen, we just don't know when, right? Um, and then in this case, they've got one credit card with a minimum monthly of, of $25. So that's um, where they don't have any student loans. Um, so on the final thing here is that, um, and usually this is just one page, but I, because of the slides, we're putting it into three. We're looking at the income. So then we have, um, the, this person is, they've got a couple sources of income. There's like a monthly paycheck of $1,200 that they get. And then somebody's paid bi-weekly $820 every two weeks, and that's um, after their um, you know, taxes and everything like that. Um, so they also have a second job where they earn about $100 a month. So they're taking home $2,900, but we did learn that between the um, monthly and those yearly, they actually need 3,466. So on a monthly basis, they don't really quite have enough, right? They're short $526 every month. Um, but over here, I kind of put in some other factors. This is, this is a family, remember they were playing daycare? Um, so if they're paid every two weeks, we get those magical third paychecks twice a month, right? Every twice a year. And so we want to factor that in as part of their, their money in. They also get a tax return that averages around $5,000 while they have kids, right, and they're working. Um, so that's not always going to be the case, but in this particular year, they're going to get a tax return. So they actually get, on average, an extra 553. So technically they can do this, right? But you got to be really careful, right? Because we don't want to get that magical tax return and go on vacation because we didn't put that in our budget over here. <laughs> um, but I will say that I would say most of the time that I'm working with someone, there isn't a way to cover that deficit. And the only way that it can be done is through decreased spending or increased money, right? This is where we talked about the debt load. Um, so a healthy monthly debt, including housing payments as rent or mortgage, should not exceed 45% of your gross before taxes, monthly income. Um, so here's, I'll just give you an example. Gross monthly income after taxes only is 3,500 for this person. So that means that um, housing, and this is really hard, especially for you young people. So Lori and I grew up in a different time period than some of you young people in here, right? Housing was less expensive, interest rates were different, right? There's a lot of factors that allowed 
us to purchase a home in our 20s that 20 year olds and 30 year olds are having a big challenge doing right now. So I want to acknowledge that just because we were able to didn't mean that we pulled ourselves up by our bootstrings. We had a different economic situation at the time in the United States that we were in the uh, in in, a, in an opportunity to be homeowners. Um, and so um, a healthy amount of housing debt is 30%, but we know that in Vermont it's often 50%, right? And um, and so this 1,050 would be the amount that they'd want to spend on housing. That includes, if you're a homeowner, mortgage, taxes, and insurance, right? So that's not a very big, fancy house. Um, in fact, that's probably like a $700 mortgage is what that is, which is probably a $100,000 loan, right? I mean, at a $150,000 loan. Um, so your other debts, car, student loan, loan payments, credit card, is in an extra um, 30 plus 15 equals 45. So you don't want it to exceed 525. So this, and why? Because going back to the budget, remember our budget back here? Where's the budget? There you go, keep coming back. All those things, firewood, hair care, Christmas and holidays, we have to pay for that out of something, right? Out of our money. So that's where that 45% comes in. And we thought we'd just throw in an example of um, the credit card interest example. Um, so in this case here, um, to give you a sort of a sense of, especially with these high, like this one here, um, the uh, for regular purchases, um, it's 17 and a half percent. If you were to do a cash advance, do you know what that is? Like you go to the ATM and you pull money out, 27.24 percent, and that's immediate. You don't get a grace period on a cash advance. Um, and so in this case, the balance is 2,900. They're saying, oh, but all you have to pay is 40 dollars, right? That's like less than two percent of the balance they're telling you you have to pay. Um, and it's due on 10-2. On um, and they say, um, if you paid only the minimum, it's going to take you 10 years to pay off this $2,900 balance. And you'll end up paying an estimated total of $5,700. So you're, it's almost twice um, in interest. But if you paid 105 only, it'll take you three years. And you'll save 1960. You'll 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 only spend 3,776 of that. <laughs> or if you pay it off in full, you'll just pay the 2,916 dollars, <laughs> right? <laughs> and that's like your the stuff that you bought food. Because what what ends up happening, especially when we look back on that budget, and it was a negative number, how do people continue to do it month after month? How do you think they do it? Well, Thank that's you. it. So yeah. this is why this is sort of a doom scenario, right? So. Um, I'm a single mom. I've mm -hmm. got three teenagers. I'm working three jobs. Mm -hmm. um, the, the budget, it's doom, yeah. right? So there's no way to do the things that you're suggesting to do. It's, I will completely con agree with you that, and I, I've said this and I'll say it again, being a single parent is one income. Right? And in your case, it's like one plus because you're working three jobs. To I mean, do it. Could be for this reason. Right. And it's exactly. Like look at the budget, and there's no yep. way. And so, you know, what, are, what do some people do? They either have partners, they get roommates, right? Because two incomes makes all the difference. Mm -hmm. And when you don't have the two incomes, you, it's until your kids are grown up. It's going they to be really hard. They just keep getting more expensive, honestly. And they, and they, <laughs> they, 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 they get so much more. I've got three in college. I mean, there's just... Yeah, and guess what? When they get out of college, I'm done. Like, I have one more year, and then I'm like, woohoo, I am done paying for you. In fact, my kids, this is what they said to me. Mom, what happens um, next year with our rent? And I said, you're paying it. You're getting a job. And they're like, OK, just, just checking. <laughs> and I'm like, uh, yeah. Just You're off the payroll. Right. I'm like, and, they, and this was a funny thing. They both asked it separately. So it wasn't like they were, they were just like, they were both curious. Like, are they going to keep paying my rent? I'm like, no, I'm not going to keep paying your rent. OK. Um, so yes, and, and you know, I, I totally agree that this is what makes it hard. And this is why it makes it hard for women. Janet said it in her speech, right? 
for the childcare costs, for everything, the, the costs of kids in college, food, Food. Food for kids? I mean, you're you're talking and so sometimes, you know, we and, and in a situation like yours, you know, if you qualify for food stamps, by all means apply for food stamps. Use a food shelf if you if, if you need to. Like those are things that are ways to sort of help bridge um, what are really expensive times right now, especially with inflation, right? The cost of food has gone up. And I and I do not um, for one minute do I say to someone like this all she needs to do is pull herself up by her bootstraps. There's no bootstraps, right? I mean, that, that's, that there's most people out there, you know, are working and they're trying to, you know, get their bills paid. They're trying to take care of their families and feed their families. And it's not always possible to do it on your own. But that's and, why I like savings at that point. I mean, like, I, I, I'm, I'm 65, but like, I was the same, I mean, I, and I had it husband but we were both in pretty low wage jobs we just had enough to get by well that's it there wasn't enough and, and, yeah. and didn't have retirement I mean and there may not even be enough to, to get, get by, by right like it, it. I mean like hopefully right. your kids you know get some jobs if they're older so that they can and at least take hard they and they take care hard. of themselves probably buy their own clothes stuff like that at this they, point they better but I mean I think it's <laughs> that you know the budget was balanced yes that's it yes exactly and now groceries cost twice as much. Yep. Fuel oil costs three times as much. I know. There's no savings. Yep. I know. So you got to use the credit card to get groceries. Exactly. You you use the credit card to get groceries. That's exactly what happens. And then you pay your credit card, so you're not necessarily killing your credit because you're able to make your payment, but you end up having to put it back on the credit card. That's exactly what happens. And you're not the only one that this happens to. Um, and you know it's. Um, I will say that you know once your kids are, are done with college, things should get easier for you. And that's the other good news, is that I still have 15 years left of work, right? Now that my kids are pretty much done. Um, so that's when often women in particular start to build their wealth, is in the last like 15 years of their, of their working life, because they had no chance to otherwise, right? And well, and I think that, you know, looking at, um, so there, there are lots of programs in Vermont, as, as Liz said, so Capstone can help you look at the budget, see if there are things that can be tailored. I'm sure you've done a great job with oh it. Oh my gosh, the local credit union this summer was great. Yeah. But so that's, that's the budget they put together and they're like, well, that now. Right. But, but there are also, so now that you, you know the numbers, there are lots of oil programs that just came out that are helping to subsidize oil costs. But for, I think this is the trick. I'm not low income. Low income. Yeah. Right. I am I am yeah. grateful for my education. Right. And even as a person with an education I'm grateful for, working three jobs that I love because I'm lucky enough to have the education that lets me do what I want to do, I can't do it. Yeah. As, and a, as a single as a single, mom, yeah, single parenting is it, it's that no, it is. It's and it, and that it, rent number on that budget, oh, I, know. I wish that was my rent for yeah. my teeny tiny crappy apartment for the four of us. Yeah. I know this was also before like all the huge price increases. Um, but you're right. I mean it's it's yeah, and I and I don't have a better answer, right? I wish yes. I did. Where's the magic? That's right. what I was saying. Right. right. I wish I had the magic. Uh are there any e-commerce business? Try listing on eBay, Mercari, Poshmark. Um, that's how I did mine. Because I was I doing the same thing. My my parents don't pay for college or rent or anything. I moved out very young, um, and that's what I did. I started going to garage sales and Goodwill and picking up books and used clothes. And even if you list one item a day, because I'm sure you're very tired at the end of that day. I was very tired doing full time and working two jobs, um, school. So you could do that, and you'd be surprised what you can sell things for. And I mean, it's crazy. I buy curtains for five dollars and sell them for eighty dollars. So oh, yeah, you can try that. Yeah, I have a, a, I know a few people who do that, and, and it can be a very lucrative side hustle that can help make those um, mm -hmm. those things happen. And the other the other handout that I have that I can email to you is is a looking at side hustles that you can do from home mm -hmm. that can that may be able to help supplement that income. Because as Liz said. There's no magic. It's you either increase the inflow or you decrease the outflow. And 
and I, I'm working with a woman who's a single mom. She's a nurse in San Francisco and has three boys as well, 13, 11, and 9. And, um, you know, she started coaching with me about six months ago. And um, every night, or when she's working on her, her stuff for our meetings, she tells the boy, I'm working on the finances. So they're like, Mom, what is this finance stuff you're like all suddenly working on? So she sat down with them and she showed them what they what she was doing. And it has an impact on kids. So I think it's, uh, it's also really important that our children know kind of what it costs to live because they're going to step into it. So it's part of that education, it's part of that generational wealth building knowledge for them to know what it costs. And to also look at education, like, does everyone need to go to an Ivy League school? No. Can we go to a state school that's going to give us a really solid education and not tank our future with student loans? Absolutely. And can we find great um, opportunities for support through grants and, and, and money that we don't have to pay back, right? So, um, so there are lots of opportunities. So looking for them, though, does take time. So I think people like Capstone, you know, I have some suggestions. You know, just, it's really just talking about with other people. And one of my girlfriends, we lived in San Francisco, we joked around, we're like, we're going to create a female commune where we all just buy one house and, yeah. and share the re responsibility of the kids so that there are two incomes and children that aren't brothers and sisters. You know? So I have two colleagues that rent out rooms. They're yeah. single, they were single parents and they rented out rooms to adults to mm -hmm. help you know, they own their home, so they were able to do that. But, you know, it's how they got by. Because, right? um, it, again, it's it's really hard on income. I completely acknowledge that. Um, yes? Does that buying property together a model that's supported by things? Mm -hmm. uh, you mean, like, um, if you bought it with a friend or something like that? For tenants on mortgage? Yeah. Yeah, it's, um, it's fine. It's just you both have to have, you know, um, Good credit. You both have to have uh, jobs, right? There's, there's. Um, I kind of always describe um, uh, your. Um, well, look, they have chalk here. Um, <laughs> like it's a classroom, <laughs> right? I didn't know they still use chalk, but like your, 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 your credit, um, your income, and your debt are. Um, you know, sort of these are the pillars that you need or the, the points that you need in order to, to be able to get a loan. So all these things have to sort of fall together. You can you can be unemployed and have great credit and you won't get a loan necessarily because you don't have a job. Um, you can have great income but bad credit and that will impact your um, in, impact your ability to, to get a loan. Yeah. Um, when you think about it, a husband and a wife are two people and they get a, they get a mortgage, right? Mm -hmm. So it's just two different people. So I've, I've bought property many times with um, friends. Um, so when I lived in San Francisco, you, you, there, was no way, there was no way to do it unless it was multiple people. Um, yes? Just a quick comment. I worked at a college for over 20 years. BSAC has a list of scholarships. There's probably a hundred of them. Um, there used to be a book with them all. Now it's online if you go. And students overlook that. I have students who come from low-income families who graduated with no debt yeah. because they spent a lot of time going through that booklet, what am I eligible for, writing essays, getting help with the essay. It, it is the best way. There's a lot that's available. There's um, a lot that's available. Yeah. But I will say, as a parent who spent a lot of time with that purple book, yeah. Every dollar my kids got in scholarship was deducted from their institutional aid. Mm -hmm. yeah. So all yeah. those hours yeah. were not helpful. Yeah. So now that my youngest is coming up, I'm like, get a job, babe, because that's at least money in the bank. Because the, those scholarships reduced the, the yeah. grant aid. Right. Yeah, it, it is. A, and, and you're right. Some, some very low-income people can get away with um, having very little, little debt. Um, or you know, go to a college where they, they don't have to spend that much because they get different grants and scholarships. Um, but I know that was we didn't do that. We did the same case. thing. Yeah, it wasn't. Yeah. They're changing some of the rules for 2024. Sorry, like mm -hmm. with, like grandparents can can now um, uh, provide some funding for the college ed application, and it doesn't decrease. Them. So that's a new rule coming up. I think it's in 2024. 
So finally, before we get to our little exercise, I, I know it feels like we're rushing through it, and I love the questions. Um, and this should have been a three-hour workshop, right? Um, we're going to just touch on retirement. Um, so it's never too early to save. Um, so if you have available to you a 401k or a 403b um, at your workplace, you want to strive for 10 to 15% of your salary. Um, you certainly want to be able to contribute at least the minimum that you do to get the match. So if your employer, so for example, at Capstone, they'll give me 4% um, as long as I give 5%. Um, so I can give more, I can give 10%, but they'll give me 4%. If I give less than 5%, they'll give me less than 4%. So you want to make sure you understand what's um, available through your employer. And I also want to, um, a lot of employers are moving away from this, but a lot of them have um, where you have to be what's called vested before you actually get that match. And that means you need to stay with your organization a certain amount of time if you actually want to collect on that match that they've given you. Um, and um, and so you know certainly before you stay there for two years and move on, if all you needed to do was stay a third year, you're financially better off doing that if you can, um, and it makes sense financially for you to do that so that you get your employer's match. Um, there's also something called like in self-employed um, uh, 401ks if you're a self-employed person, and then there's also. Um, well, I think I say anything wrong. Yeah, uh, so yeah, the self-employed and solo 401k for self-employed people. Um, and then there's just IRAs um, if no place is available. And there's something, there's two types. There's traditional IRAs and Roth IRAs. There's also usually in your employer-based um, 401k, you can choose to either have it be Roth, meaning it's um, after tax contributions that you've made so you don't get a tax you don't get you you don't see your your income lowered um, your taxable income lowered um, but the good news about that is that you never get taxed on that retirement again so you're you're taxed on it in the year that you give the money um, but as it grows and when you use it and you you earn interest on it none of it that gets taxed if you pass it on to your family um, they would have to pay taxes on it but you in your lifetime don't have to pay taxes on it um, and, uh, and so, you know, you can often start with as little as like $500, $250, depending on, um, on uh, the, organ the financial institution. Um, and, you know, for any kind of savings, I always say make it automatic, right? Like take just something out of your paycheck so you don't see it, um, or, or set it up if you're, if you're self-employed, set it up so that automatically um, the money goes there um, to, to your retirement. And then, you know, just quickly on Social Security, um, uh, Social Security has become, you know, an important part of people's retirement. It really was not designed to be the main retirement for people um, because in the old days they had uh, pensions. So, you know, if you worked for, um, and they still do, like uh, universities have pensions, schools have pensions. But like in the old days, say you worked for like Boeing or something like that, right? Um, they might have had a pension fund, which was like a guaranteed income that you would get every month until you died. And maybe if you set it up so that your spouse gets it until they die, um, and that's, that's your pension. Um, but those became very expensive for companies to maintain and to fund. So they, the onus was switched to you <laughs> to save for your retirement. And we'll give you a little extra money if, you're, if you work for us, right? So it went from them paying it and then going, you know, many companies not really being able to afford their, pun, uh, or fund their, pun, their pension plans to you being responsible. Um, and that's called a defined contribution. So Social Security was never designed to fully support you in your retirement. Um, and, um, and so, and women in particular, because we take time off from work, lose those earning years in our retirement because what they do is they take the highest 30 earning years that you that you have to figure out what your monthly payment is so women traditionally have a far lower social security payment than men because they've taken time off in the workplace and their higher earning years are when they're older and and you know then they retire um, so um, the longer, if, you're, if you anticipate living a long time and you can wait until you're 72 um, to take your Social Security, that'll be your highest um, 
available balance that you can get. You can take it as early as 62, but you're, it's a much lower balance um, than, or a much lower monthly payment amount. Um, and some people like to wait till their full retirement age, which for me I think is 67. Um, and, uh, and I anticipate, like, how are they gonna fund, right? There's all these worries, like, what's gonna happen to Social Security and Medicare, right? Mm -hmm. How are they gonna fund it is probably through raising the age, because people are working longer, for you to get your full retirement balance. So some of the young people, it might, it's 67 today, if you're young in this room, but it could turn to 70, right? Or, um, or they will um, increase the percentage that we give to Social Security. Um, which is like 7.6% or something. Um, so, um, so Social Security, if you go to ssa.gov, you can see what you're projected to get. Um, but again, that is dependent on you working until your full retirement age, um, assuming that you're making that salary that you're making for the rest of your life. So it's a little bit, this isn't a guarantee of what you're actually gonna get is what I'm trying to say. And the news is, is that by the time I retire, it might be 30% less anyway. So just keep that in mind when you're thinking about um, and planning for your retirement. So we have a few more minutes, and Lori, this, I'm going to pass it on to you. And we might just make a little switch. <laughs> yeah. um, we were going to walk through a, um, a handout and have you work on it, but I think we might. We might punt on that, give it, give it to you as homework. <laughs> um, so financial goals, why are they, why do we want to establish them, right? So financial goals give us something to work towards, gives us focus as we're working to sitting down and, and planning our, our budget and our spending and, and how we're going to make, make the dollars stretch, right? Because that's what, we're, what we end up doing, stretching them out. If you have a partner setting financial goals together, make sure you're playing on the same team. That partner doesn't necessarily need to be your spouse. That partner could be the children in your home if you're a single parent, right? So it's making sure you're playing on the same team so that your children understand how you're spending the dollars. So they, you know, like if they just, they're eating because they feel like it rather than eating because they're hungry. Like, you know, there's a lot we spend on snacks and junk food and that kind of stuff. So really make sure you're playing on the same team by having financial goals and bringing the people in your family into the conversation. It also helps us to ensure that we're planning on what we, what we want to do with our money. So if there is extra money that we can stretch out of that budget, she needs to be let in that oh, numbers lost. Um, the, um, that we're planning what we want to do with our money. So it helps us to do that. And setting one goal at a time so that we can, you know, we can measure that goal, meet it, and then set the next one. So help, just working on one at a time as you're starting to add financial goal planning into your into your monthly to-dos is, is, a, is a good uh, thing to do. And also give every dollar a job, right? So if, if you, you know what your paychecks are, right, don't leave $200 in your checking account, because guess what? It's going. If it's there, it's gone, right? So I just sat down with this uh, one woman who's a teacher, and you know, we, we put her on a different kind of budget. I call it the plan ahead method. So we take every paycheck and we, d we allocate every dollar in that paycheck mm -hmm. and where it's going. And some of it's going into savings accounts, right? Um, so we put them into you know, a gift savings account. It might be $5 a month that goes in there, but it's, but it's an amount that's set aside for those annual purchases or those things that happen once at, you know, or the finance or the emergency fund. So, you know, we do this paycheck at a time and she's like, oh my God, like this changed my life because I used to just like, you know, play the shell game with money and move it around and, but if I look at it paycheck at a time and I'm, and as soon as I get that paycheck, I make those payments that are going to get paid with that paycheck. There's not money sitting in my savings account or in my checking account for me to do anything else with because it's already been allocated. So th things like that can be a game changer and, and you know, just looking at your money differently. So give every dollar a job so that it doesn't create its own. Because if, if it's left to just do its own thing, it's not going to do what you want it to do. So um, what we were going to do, and I'm going to, this is audience participation time. Liz and I can take more questions or we can go through this handout. We were just going to go through financial goals and we have a handout that you can, that you can fill out. I can go through how we would do it. Um, but we were going to give you about 15 or 20 minutes, and we're going to be right at the end of time. So if you'd rather spend the time asking questions, if there are things that you'd like us to cover, we'd be happy to do that. Yes? I just wanted to say there's an app called, 
think it's called every dollar you can use. Yes. And it, mm -hmm. and it does exactly what you said, and you yep. can actually change um, the names and everything. That's what anybody mm -hmm. wanted to. I think Unity Budget right. does that too, doesn't it? That's Mine right. Yeah. As well. So what, what she's talking about is there are apps that you can use for financial budgeting. So every dollar is one. YNAB or Unita Budget, Y-N-A-B, um, is another one that I use with some of my clients. Some people like to do things on an app and then they find it easier to, to kind of manage it. You can link your accounts, so you can link your credit cards, you can link your banking accounts to it so it sees when you have money coming in it puts the transactions in and you just have to categorize what they are so that budget that Liz showed earlier you can automate the filling out of that and you can have it start to look for trends and help find ways that you can save money so there are lots of tools out there like that there are hundreds of them but Mint I use a little bit the nice thing about Mint is that Mint also gives you your credit score so it can give you a credit score as well as help you work that budget YNAB, uh, or you need a budget, I like that because it gives me month over month reporting. I can just pull up a month that shows, I have to pull up a report that shows in January, here was the income and expenses, February, income and expenses. So you can start to see where there are trends seasonally, and you can start to see where there are things that you spend money on annually. So as you're putting that budget together, it gives you a lot more information. Um, and every dollar, I, I haven't used that one, but um, YNAB and Mint have used. So, they're all good. Just find one that, if you're going to use it, if you're going to sign up and use one, use it. I know a lot of people who like set it up and then they don't use it. It's they're really helpful. Um, and be aware that there will be ads. So if they're free, <laughs> there will be ads, and they'll say, "Hey, here's a new credit card for you." So be careful of the ads. <laughs> But some of them are helpful because they target, they look at the data, it's all artificial intelligence, right? They look at the data, they look at what's going in there, and then they target ads to you based on your spending and your income. So there is targeted advertisement, okay? So, um, other questions? Yes? Uh, loans versus savings. Say you have half the money to pay for a car, or use mm -hmm. a car. Um, is it better to borrow the full amount and hang on to your savings so you have the reserve? Mm -hmm. you know, I go back and forth because interest rates obviously are low on savings. And That's right. That's right. So first of all, I'm going to talk about savings because you, you, you gave me an in there. So um, how many people have their money in savings accounts at their bank? <laughs> how many at a credit union? How much interest are you earning per month? Nothing. <laughs> yeah, like 0.01% or 0.1%. If you did nothing more than take your savings account and put it in a high yield savings account, so the one that I use is called Ally, A L L Y dot com, and I don't promote them, I don't get anything from anyone using them, but their interest rate right now is 2.15. So, if you're in a passbook savings and you're getting 0.1 on your money, mm -hmm. I, I don't know, I, that's kind of like you're not, it's not even beating inflation. Right. So, um, mm -hmm. so I would first of all put my savings in a higher yield savings account so that you're getting a little bit more every month. Yeah. Um, and what's nice about these high yield savings accounts is you can create buckets. So you could put you know, your, annual, your monthly savings in there and you're saying, mm -hmm. Five of that five dollars a month goes into gifts. Ten dollars goes into my car maintenance fund. Some goes into my emergency fund. You can set up all those savings envelopes, mm -hmm. so that you can have visibility to how much you've put aside. And one of the things that I work on with my clients is that if you're going to put it aside and you're going to have a plan ahead budget, you can only spend on those things that are luxury items when you have it. So you've got to put it aside, and you visibly know when you have it because it's in that bucket. Right, so it's the austerity measure of <laughs> working with our finances. Um, so on a car loan, what I would look at is if that money was in a savings account or invested, am I gonna make more on the interest in an investment or am I gonna pay more interest on a car loan? So if the car loan is 5%, but I've got it in the stock market and I've historically been making 10%, I might do, stick that in. <laughs> it would be door monitor. Um, then I might look at that. It, and, and some of that is emotional. So if you remember earlier I said, you know, some decisions about finances are emotional. Like, 
I hate having a car payment because the moment you drive that car off the lot, it loses value, right? So I do not take car loans. I have not since I was 30 years old. So I will, I will only buy a car when I've saved the money for it and I pay cash for it. So it's a personal opinion. Do you have a... Um, yeah, I mean, you. It depends. You you want to have some sort of emergency savings if you if you don't. Um, and um, and again, like she said, it's it's often a psychological thing. Um, and it also can deal with cash flow, right? So a car loan is going to give you an, an extra monthly payment every month. Yeah. Um, and and you know, so yeah. Either way, and I also I'll just i sort of say the opposite of what Lori just said is that I like to keep my money in Vermont because of the Vermont mm -hmm. credit unions, yeah. um, and so just to give you a perspective of two percent versus zero percent, if you put in a thousand dollars, that's like a dollar a month mm -hmm. that you're earning, and so is it worth putting your money out of state when the credit unions really are there to support our local? communities, right? And they do that through um, your money, right? You doing business with them. So that's just my little spiel. I, I would agree with that, too. Um, so it, And it really just depends, right? And sometimes your credit union, so I was having this conversation with a friend, because I talk about money with all my friends. <laughs> so we were sitting down and having lunch, and she said, you know what, I just went to my local credit union, and they gave me 2.5%. So ask. Right. You can also buy the I bond. I think through Absolutely. October, which is nine point six three percent, you can give, and it's completely safe. It's through the Vermont Treasury, uh, Vermont, through the U.S. Treasury, Treasury. Uh, Direct. If you go to TreasuryDirect.gov, I think it is. Um, you yep. can invest up to ten thousand uh, dollars per calendar year per person and get nine point six for six months, um, and you have to keep it there for a year in order to get that nine point six three percent. And it will be adjusted again, and we still have inflation, so I don't know what yeah. the new rate is going to be. But it's a it's completely uh, backed by the government, right? The so, so, state or federal, take take your pick where you put your money. And like Liz said, that that's a guaranteed income, and that might be enough if you put it in to make that car payment that's going to add to your monthly budget. So. It's really kind of looking at everything you've got. So it's hard to take one decision and say, oh, this is what I do. Mm -hmm. I sit down with all of my clients, and the first thing we do is a net worth and a monthly spending budget so that, so that we're making decisions with all of the information in front of us. Um, because it's hard to just pick and choose what's the right thing. It's got it's to fit into your life situation. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So I think we're going to, I'm going to make an executive decision. We're going to skip the goal setting. We're going to skip that. And we're just going to, um, it's their homework. Yeah, <laughs> you can take it. So SMART goals are, you know, specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, and time bound. So if you're going to set up an emergency fund, you want to put $1,000 in it, and you can, you can take $200 a month out of your expenditure, expenditures to put towards that emergency savings. Well, it's going to take you five months, right? So. Make it specific, make it measurable, make it achievable, and make it realistic and time bound. It may take you 10 months, it may take you 12 months, but just you know, understand what that's gonna take. This is the goal setting exercise. You can have the handout if you want it. But your question, and whoops, your question and what Liz was just saying, there are lots of financial wellness organizations in Vermont, and I think this is a little more important than the goals for a worksheet. <laughs> You know, Mercy. If you're a, if you're a small if you're a woman who's starting a small business, Mercy Connections. Uh, Claire uh, Wheeler is here today from Mercy Connections. They have a women's small business program, and they help women get their businesses started. So there's lots of um, support from them. The Vermont Women's Fund. Meg is here today, um, and that's an organization that can provide funding to women's businesses. So the at the one o'clock the the martial arts women who are doing the the training on. Defense uh, happens to be one of my friends, and they just got a grant from the Vermont Women's Fund to keep their program going. Um, so that, you know there are lots of organizations that are funding women's um, work in the state. The Vermont Community Loan Fund. So Vermont Community Loan Fund, you can donate money to, or you can invest your money in, and there is a guaranteed return on that as well. And um, they take that money then and loan it out. And 63% of the money that Vermont Community Loan Fund loans out goes to women-owned businesses. 
it's not by design, it's by happenstance, it's by what's happening in this state. It's because Pat Leahy's been doing the Women's Economic Opportunity Conference for 20 years, 25 years, maybe. <laughs> um, but the leadership team, there's a lot of women on the Vermont Community Loan Fund. Um, credit unions, Liz m mentioned that. And then Liz, can you talk a little bit about Green Saving yeah, Smart sure. and the Community Action Partnership? Yeah, so the Vermont Community Action Partnership um, is throughout the entire state. There's um, Capstone, which is where I'm from, which is the Washington and Memorial counties. There's Brock, which is in um, like the Benny, um, sorry, the um, Rutland area. There's Sefka in southeast Vermont, um, NECA in the Northeast Kingdom, and CBOEO, which is up in the Burlington area. So we cover all of the community, uh, all of the counties in Vermont, um, and we offer um, things like fuel assistance. Um, we work with uh, people needing facing homelessness and eviction. We have the Head Start. Um, early childhood uh, programs. Um, the the programs that I oversee at my community action are at all the other community action agencies as well, um, which is the micro business developments. We do business coaching for free, financial coaching for free, and then we have this thing called um, Green Saving Smart, which is statewide now, which is what I mentioned earlier, which is doing financial coaching, but with the lens of how can we help you transition away from fossil fuel technologies in your home heating and your transportation um, costs. Another thing that all the community action uh, partnerships work with, except for NECA, but there's NEDO up there, is weatherization. Um, so if you're, um, if you're income eligible, and that's based on your family size, um, they, you can get free weatherization services um, to weatherize your home if, they have, if it hasn't been weatherized in 15 years. Um, or more. So um, yeah, so that's um, these these are these are programs that really are designed to help um, lend many of these women in particular, but just everyone, you know, achieve better economic self sufficiency. So. Liz. Yes. You have offered to um, pull reports yes. for folks. Do you want them to just maybe put an asterisk? Yeah, would they? That would be here? great. Yes. If somebody okay. does, um, we're happy to. When I get back to the office, um, pull your credit report if you want to have someone sort of look at it and give you some professional <laughs> advice. <laughs> just come up here and put a little asterisk next to it, and we can help you. So just a couple more slides. So. Well, I, I love quotes and I love Maya Angelou, so she always makes her way into my presentations. But I think the, the one thing that I, the one quote of hers that I really resonate <laughs> with is forgive yourself for not knowing what you didn't know before you knew it, right? <laughs> Experience is the best teacher, and we have to learn things before we can bring them into our lives, right? So learn from the people around you, feel comfortable and open to having the conversation. There were a few of you that, that are recently widowed and you might live close to each other, so have conversations about how to help each other, right? And, and open up that, that line of conversation. So just in summary, some of the things that we talked about, talk to people in your life about finances. Find your people. You will be surprised at the number of ideas that might come up that you didn't think about. Um, and it's because it didn't come from your experience. Our experience is unique to us, so everyone else has a different experience. Um, and one thing I would suggest, and I didn't have this in here, is um, there's an organization called um, Choose Financial Independence. It's Choose FI. And it's every week you get an email of just the things, the creative things that people are doing to make a 1% improvement in their bottom line. So it's Financial Independence, Retire Early, F-I-R-E, FIRE Movement, you'll hear talked about. So at Choose FI, it's a great organization. There's lots of podcasts, lots of information of just ways to, to just streamline your budgets. Um, know your credit scores, know your numbers, know your steps to improve your credit score, know your net worth, it, measure it. Net worth is something I suggest to my clients that they do once or twice a year. You don't need to do it every month. Um, it gets impacted, but it's a good to just you know kind of see the trends happening. And establish a budget or a spending plan, whether you do that on a piece of paper, whether you do it in an Excel spreadsheet or a Google Sheet, or whether you do it in YNAB or Every Dollar or Mint, whatever works for you, do it and keep it up. I still use spreadsheets. Uh, I'm a spreadsheet kind of girl. So I use spreadsheets and I have a lot of them. So whenever my clients are like, oh, I'm doing this, I'm like, oh, I got a spreadsheet for that. Um, but, but just do it. Do it and, and make it a habit. Set and monitor financial goals. You can take the handout if you'd like it. And know where to obtain assistance if, you're, if, if needed. So we talked about all those organizations, and there are plenty more. So, um, so just look for them, find them, 
our contact information is here, and as, I, as we said, um, everyone who signed in and gave us your email will send you this presentation, so you don't have to write copious notes, but we'll PDF and send this out to you so you have it. Um, and if you do want Liz and her organization to pull a credit report, feel free to stop up here and put an asterisk by your name, and we'll get that taken care of. So thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you, you all for your time. time.